Hey, Nathaniel, how are you doing? Hey, Max, I'm good. Cool. So uh, Nathaniel and Dan, thank you both so much for joining us today. I'm really excited about this talk. Um, we're sort of a weird group that we're mostly grad students in computer science, but we get like professional engineers and mathematicians who drop in sometimes. Um, and, and as such, we host like a pretty broad variety of talks from kind of pure math talks to kind of systems stuff as, you know, Roger here has presented uh, to uh, more applied security stuff. So I think this will be a really fun one. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand you the stage and, you know, modulo the possibility of technical difficulties. And uh, thank you again for joining. Sounds good. Dan, you want to share the slides? Yeah, certainly. Is that visible for everyone? Yeah, that's great. Yep. So hi, everyone. Uh, Dan and I and the rest of the Intel Chipsec team, uh, obviously, I'll work for Intel. Um, I'm expecting at least uh, Aaron and Sarah to probably pop in, but they're just will we'll be here to observe. Um, Dan and I will be conducting the, the presentation. So this is mostly just an intro to Chipsec and a little bit of background and how it works and why we like it and think it's a useful tool. You go to the next slide. There we go. So it's just obligatory legal notice because Intel and corporate speak. Um, you can go to the next slide. There we go. So agenda, we're going to do an overview, uh, getting chips up and running in Linux, and then give a tell a story about an end-to-end -end, uh, vulnerability to mitigation to uh, testing to research and, and a few things in between. Um, so a quick overview of Chipsec. Um, it's a Python framework that is there to analyze a platform, a personal computer platform, hardware, firmware, and system components. Uh, it was originally developed by Yuri back when he was at Intel. He's no longer at Intel. Um, I believe he is at a startup called Eclipsium, which specializes in firmware security and protection. Um, the first version of Chipsec was released publicly to the open source in March 2014 at the CanSec West Conference. Um, and it's currently used, utilized quite a bit by firmware developers, both inside and outside of Intel, um, system integrators, so like OEMs, uh, like Dell, Lenovo, et cetera, um, and system validation teams, both again, inside and outside Intel and uh, penetration teams. So we have a public GitHub. Uh, you can find us at chipsec slash chipsec on GitHub. Then we also have a public documentation site there also hosted on GitHub. And throughout this whole thing, if, if you have questions and want to interrupt me, please feel free to do so. Um, so the, the, the architecture of Chipsec is this. Uh, so at the very top, we have Chipsec main and Chipsec util. Those are the two entry points that once you get it up and running, uh, you will most likely be using. Uh, Chipsec main is more the validation side of things, and Chipsec util is more the research and pen testing side of the, the suite. Um, so for Chipsec main, we've got modules and tools that feed into the, the main program. So when you run Chipsec main without any arguments, it goes through all the modules that we have defined and checks different aspects of the platform and if verifies or checks to make sure the configuration is set up correctly. Um, all those modules uh, in their default settings uh, are non-destructive. So if you run that on your system, uh, you sh will not uh, break your system. That cannot be said with the tools or the commands, though. So be warned. If you don't know what you're doing, you could possibly break your system. Um, do the, do the non-destructive ones still have side effects that are observable? No. OK. Um, it's just observing the system at a, at a passive sense and looking to make sure the configuration is according to what Intel says or what yeah. other people say. Cool. Yeah. Um, 
And then under that, so we have the hardware extraction layer. So things like memory or PCI or spy reads and writes, all those things are in the how in the how layer. Um, and then below that, we've got the OS helpers. So there's there's a generic OS helper that basically loads, does the loading of the drivers and makes sure you're in the right environment for, or checks your environment and then loads the right driver. And then under that, we have uh, OS specific helpers. Those actually do the communication to the underlying drivers. And then we have the kernel drivers below that. So next slide. So the general flow of the program, right? So when you write Python chipsec main or chipsec util, it'll um, select the, the it'll identify your environment and load the specific helpers and drivers if needed. It will then go in and actually detect what platform you have. So like what CPU or what uh, PCH and whatnot you have actually on your system. It will load the corresponding configuration files and then it'll load the modules or utils that you're wanting to run. It'll run them and then give a report back and then clean up the, the kernel module at the end. So getting up and running with Linux. So we have a number of environments that we have. Uh, Linux is the most useful most of the time. Um, the other two main ones are Windows, obviously, and the UEFI shell. Um, Windows is a little more complicated. We have instructions on our, our documentation in our documentation on how to get that up and running. But uh, Windows is just open and easier to work with a lot of times. So the four main components that you need before getting started is you need Python, obviously. Uh, the two compilers you need are GCC and NASM. GCC for the C code and NASM for the assembly. Uh, we have some raw assembly instructions to help uh, do some of the low level reads and writes. And then you need your Linux kernel header files. Um, so once you have those, uh, these are just the three different um, package repos, right? across the different Linux distros. Um, so once you have that, you can grab the source from GitHub with git clone. And then there are some requirements. Uh, the main requirement that you need for Python is you need an up-to-date uh, setup tools to install. Um, we are recently made a change to um, be able to support Python 3.12 when it's released. Uh, there's some changes to the set of tools there. So we need to make sure that you guys are up to up to the uh, a current version of set of tools. Um, so there's a, there's a gotcha there. Uh, currently, if you're running an old version of Python before 3.7, I think. Um, so yeah, so once you install the, have the, the Python dependencies, you can, uh, uh, build the driver. Sorry, can you go back slide? Uh, with the Python 3 setup tools, build ext, which is build external, and dash i is in place. So everything is contained in the in the local folder. Um, that's our recommended way to build currently. Now you can go to the next slide. So once you build the driver, you can run chipsec main. Uh, so this is just a, a snippet from one of my uh, local uh, Linux Nook systems that I have on hand. So this is just the header and it goes through and loads all the modules and it'll execute them and give you a nice uh, result at the end. If you go to the next slide. So at, at once it finishes the report for Chipsec main, uh, all the modules will give you a status. It'll either be pass, fail, warning info, not applicable or error. Hopefully you won't see any errors if you run this on your systems. If you do, feel free to reach out to us uh, or submit a bug. Uh, on GitHub, because there shouldn't be any errors. Um, but if your system fails a test, uh, we as Chipset can't really do anything. You'd have to go to whoever developed your system and poke them to say, hey, you're failing a test. Or you can try to fix it yourself, but that's a lot more complicated. So uh, next slide. 
Yeah, so as I mentioned, we have got Windows and UEFI shell as the other two main environments that we run in, and there's links to the documentation. I can share this slide deck with you, uh, Max, if you want, um, so you can have, get all the links and such. Yeah, that would be awesome. I can post it on the website afterward. Yeah, uh, next slide. And I'll pass it off to Dan for this part. Thanks. Um, I hope everybody can hear me all right. I'll uh, take this time to discuss a little bit about um, a vulnerability that was discovered, a module that was created to prevent the issue from occurring out in the wild. And then we'll do a little bit of demonstration on how that kind of works. Um, starting, uh, you got to protect your flash. Uh, system firmware needs to be secure. It's responsible for the system bring up and it has access to the entire software stack. But at the same time, um, we also want our firmware to be updatable. Uh, that's important to add features and patch bugs as they're found. But uh, the two requirements are in conflict with each other. Um, it's kind of hard to figure out how to keep something secure, but also updatable. Um, the intended solution from Intel chipsets uh, is two mechanisms for flash programming and flash protection. Uh, flash programming is handled by the SPI. Um, there are several registers that are used for flash programming operations. And then protection is handled via the BIOS control and protected range registers. Um, in BIOS control, there are three fields of interest. There's the system management mode BIOS write protection. There's BIOS write enable and BIOS lock enable. And the protected range registers can be programmed to mask off regions of flash memory um, as unprogrammable. Uh, unfortunately, um, there was an exploit that was discovered and a white paper produced by Corey Kallenberg and Raffle Watchduck, and it demonstrates um, a way to subvert the flash protections on Intel chipsets. So I'm going to talk about that a little bit. Um, this exploit works on multi-core systems where the BIOS write protection field is unset. Uh, the attacker can program one core on a toggle loop for BIOS write enable, and then another core can be on a, a loop to repeatedly attempt flash protection or flash programming operations. Um, in this, there's a race condition that exists, and it allows the flash uh, programming operations to um, subvert the toggle loop of the BIOS write enable. And when that happens, uh, the attacker can make changes to any portion of BIOS outside of the protected range masks. Um, it is found that protected range masks can also be bypassed um, using this known exploit. Uh, the UAFI firmware uh, environment contains non-volatile variables that uh, are written to flash that need to be updated during runtime. So because of that, they can't actually be uh, hidden under protected range masks. Um, so if you use the race condition, race condition exploit uh, and actually gain access to one of these uh, non-volatile variables, you can uh, make arbitrary changes to the region metadata. And because it's needed for um, runtime updates, the firmware trusts the variable region um, just inherently. And so when you gain access to these variables, you can modify uh, the boot flow. You can have malicious code execution. Um, you can gain control of the entire boot process. Um, so historically, uh, manufacturers weren't uh, following Intel guidelines and weren't ensuring that these BIOS write protection bits were um, set to lock. And so these vulnerabilities were exposed and out in the wild. Um, and the chipsec team decided to uh, create a module in response to uh, validate that systems are secure uh, coming out to market. Uh, we wrote a module. I, I guess I shouldn't say we. I wasn't involved personally in this writing. But the chipsec team created a module called BIOS Write Protection. And uh, it's a simple module. It checks the system management mode and spy-based protection mechanisms to ensure that the BIOS region is write protected. Uh, our platforms uh, are read through configuration files uh, in the chipsec tool. Um, it tells them where what address is to go check on the, the firmware. Um, and what happens is our module will go inspect 
the BIOS control register, and it will look for the lock enable, the write enable, and the write protection bits to be set to their proper settings. Um, lock enable must be set, write enable must be unset, and write protection must be set. Um, it'll also go back and check the SPI protected ranges and ensure that the BIOS region, its, its range of addresses is covered uh, by those protected registers. Um, and with that, I would like to let Nathaniel give you a bit of a demonstration on how some of this works on our systems. That way you can get a better view of what's going on. Can you stop sharing and then I can? I sure can. I will see how well this works. Who can share? That's not what I wanted to click. I wanted to click that button. There we go. Share. All right, hopefully you guys can see my window coming up here. Looks good to me. All right, so this is, I'm remoting into my Nook system, my, my little Linux box. Um, so I have already Chipsec pulled from GitHub and I already did the, the build instructions, but I can run the build instructions again. Just, ah, it helps if I copy and not paste over what I'm trying to copy. All right, so this is just the setup build ext i so it's building in place. I already have it all compiled. So it'll just say, hey, nothing to do here, which is good. So um, in order to, to investigate this BIOS write protect uh, information, um, we're wanting to look at the BIOS control register. So if you go to the Intel website and you look up the data sheet for whatever your platform is, this is the Kaby Lake system. Uh, so if you go pull down the uh, data sheet for Kaby Lake and you look through the documentation, you'll be able to find out that the um, BIOS control register is in the PCIe config space uh, on bus zero device 31, which is hex 1F, uh, function 5 offset DC. Um, so with the chipsec util, we can literally put all that information right in here and say Python chipsec util PCI read 01F5 at offset DC. And when we run that, it will ask me for my password because Linux, and it'll say, hey, so we were able to install a kernel module. And uh, just so you know, I'm doing a direct read to a specific address. So it doesn't actually need to load a configuration. So it says, hey, I'm not loading a configuration. So you won't have a recognized platform. But on this read, we got a value, oh, shoot, um, A2. Actually, let me. Hmm. Nathaniel, you should have done that, uh, typed it out, because you would have tricked us into thinking you're doing it from memory. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, true. Sorry. De demo. Uh, but actually, let me, we have a little bit of time. So let me do a quick reset uh, on this system. Uh, that's not what I want. I want to do. Uh, restart. That's what I wanted to do. No. Uh, all right. We'll do this. Yeah, no. No. What's going on? Uh, pseudo. All right. Uh, so my sharing will go down, and I will once it comes back up in. 30 seconds, I'll share again. Uh, the system, I was playing with the system earlier and got it in a state that I didn't necessarily want it in right now. So sorry about that. This is how every academic demo goes. So it's it's par for the course. <laughs> yeah, demos in general, not necessarily just academic, it seems. <laughs> I guess it helps if I turn it back on after shutting it down. Nathaniel, are you coding all day in X11? Because that seems like hell to your eyeballs. Just no. Stare, just like pixelated Mo font all day. <laughs> no, most of the time I'm in VS code. Okay, cool. 
Okay, here we go. Now I can just make this window smaller and start sharing again. Let me know when you guys, uh, it doesn't look like I, looks like I have one more button to click. Share, there we go. Yep, it's back up now. All right, get chip sec. All right, so we're back here, and now if I go past my resets, so if we read this value again, there we go. That's what I was expecting. Triple A. Um, so we don't really know what triple A means at this point, but we know. I mean, it seems valid, right? It's not all zeros or all Fs. So uh, there's something there, it's reporting something, but I don't really know what it is. So part of the power of ChipSec is we have these configurations defined. So uh, we can do sudo python3 chipsec util uh, reg for register, read bc for BIOS control. And when we do that, hey, look, now we have Uh, decode of what AAA stands for. So we know that bit zero is BIOS write enable. That bit is not set. We have BIOS lock enable is set. And we have SMM BIOS write protect is set. So those are the three values that Dan was talking about. Um, and so we can see from here that we're set up correctly uh, to protect our flash. Uh, at this point. Um, so we can actually run chipsec main, uh, chipsec main. It helps if I type it correctly, sudo python3 chipsec main. And we can uh, specify a, a specific module to run, and we want to do common.bios right protect. Um, so as Dan was talking about, right? So it goes in, reads the BIOS control, and then it does some calculations to make sure those three bits are set properly. And it says, hey, you're good. Things are looking good here. And it also says, okay, so your BIOS region, the base and the limit are at these addresses on your spy chip. And it goes in and checks the protected ranges. We've got one protected range set up and it's for 24, or 240,000 to uh, 8,000, which almost exactly maps over the BIOS range. But as Dan also mentioned, right, the, the UEFI firmware or UEFI variables uh, need to be stored somewhere in Flash. So that's what that first 40K is. Um, so we got a pass from this module that says, hey, this platform is not vulnerable to those attacks. And you can say, I mean, sure, it, it's nice that it says that, but is it really? Um, so we also have another util for the spy util. So let's look at that. So if we do sudo python3 chipsec util uh, spy. So if you just do the base command, it'll normally give you some information on the tools you can use or the subcommands under that command. Um, if you just do chipsec util, so list out all the commands that are available. Um, so for the spy command, there's this subcommand that says disable write protect. That could be interesting. So let's try to disable our spy write protect. Disable write protect. So it went in and tried and said, oh, sorry, we weren't able to disable it, which is good for us. Uh, bad for attackers, but good for us as we're the owners of the system. And sure, okay, um, that's nice and all. You say you tried to disable write protect. I don't know if I quite buy that. Um, so we can also go in and try to manually um, set up. So I will, I will just copy and paste this one because I uh, don't want to typo it 
but so for this command, right, we're just using the util again, and we're going to do a PCI write this time to the same address and the same offset. Uh, the next variable is the size. So we're going to do four bytes. And we're going to write a one in there. And if you if we scroll up a little bit to what the BIOS protect is. So writing a one in here would set BIOS write enable to one, uh, lock enable to zero, and the SMM write protect to zero, and everything else to zero. But we don't really care about anything else. We're trying to get those three bits flipped. So if we scroll back down and we try that, it'll say, hey, it wrote. OK, so let's try reading it back now. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. Let's just do a register read. So from here, we used to read AAA, right? Now we're reading AA2. So we did flip something, but unfortunately, it wasn't the bits that we were gunning for. Um, BIOS write enable is still not set. Lock enable is still set. And SMM write protect is still set. So we were able to clear this uh, spy read configuration, but we don't really care about that because it doesn't allow us to write to spy flash. So it looks like we are good to go on this system um, and secure. Unfortunately, that, that makes it harder to hack on, but at least malicious people can't go in here and also uh, hack on our system, which is generally a good thing. Uh, any questions so far? Comments? Could you tell us about the converse scenario where you have a chip that's not secure? So yeah, we can talk about that a little bit. Um, so there's another spy command, the spy info. So let's look at that right now. So instead of trying to disable write protect, let's just do info. So this dumps out a bunch of information. Um, we'll scroll back up to the top of this. So there's a bunch of different spy flash regions. Uh, so the main one that we are concerned about is this BIOS region, right? That's the one we looked at. Um, but there's other regions in here as well. Um, and the one of interest that I'm that we can demonstrate on is this GBE. Uh, GBE is for the onboard uh, NIC on your system. Um, it has this small range of of memory space, non volatile space to store information. Um, it uh, is not super critical, but it's there and. So like if you were to nuke this whole region, I believe your your network still will function, but it might not be functioning as expected completely. Uh, so proceed with caution. But the the nice thing about this region right now is if we go down, so this is the uh, access permissions, spy access permissions. We can see that this GBE, we have write access and we have read access. And if we look at the protected ranges, there is no protected range around that region. So we should be able to investigate that a little further. Uh, so we can use the spy command again to read. So the beginning of that region was 1,000. So we'll do hex 1,000. And we'll just read the first 80 bytes on it. Um, so if you run that, Chipsec dumps the the reads of spy into a file called read.bin. So we'll do a hex read of read.bin. So there's information here. Um, I'm not going to uh, work on this area just because I don't really want to brick my nick right now. Um, but let's look, if we look a little higher in the region, so if we look at 2200, and I'll just add this and xxd read.bin. So this region is completely empty. So um, if we had, if we were able to get write access to the spy flash in the main BIOS region, we would have a similar ability to dump and uh, investigate. Although in the spy, the, the BIOS region, you can still 
dump is just protected, so you can't write to it. Um, but this area we can write to. So if we use the same or a similar uh, command and we do spy write and we do 0x2200 and we pass in a file. So I have a write message dot bin that I created. It do that and it says, hey, I'm going to go write a bunch of chunks into the spy flash. And if we go back and read that section now, it says, hey, don't worry, it's all fine. Um, but now if we were to reset the system again and reboot and look into this region again, it will still be there because it's in non-volatile flash. Um, so depending on where this is, what what talks to this memory region on the spy chip and uh, how the firmware is put together, uh, you can do fun things. <laughs> so, uh, and then just a little more. Uh, so spies generally are, you can't erase or you can't rewrite spy regions. Um, the way spy works is you have to do an erase cycle and then clear everything out, and then you can write over it again. If you just were to write over the same spot again, it will only flip flip the zeros to ones. It won't flip the ones back to zeros uh, unless you do an erase cycle first. Um, so a chipset can do that as well, right? We can, instead of doing a read, we can do erase at zero x. There, uh, region aligned to every thousand bytes. So you have to do a thousand at a time. So if we do that, we erase that chunk and then we can read back that region and now it's all cleared again. So yeah, that is most of the demo. Um, I can, any other comments, questions? All right, well, uh, we have a couple more slides. I think I can do that as well. Let me just flip that and then which one is it? It's not actually showing me which one it is. New share. You need a slide one. All right. So that it is. Can you see the slideshow? Yep. Yep. All right. So as is an open source, you're welcome to uh, contribute and work, do it yourself, and use it for your own research and investigation. Uh, if you want to reach us directly, you can reach uh, the, the Intel Chipsec team at chipsec at intel.com. We also have a, a public Discord server. So if you want to jump on there, uh, you're welcome. There's a decent community that's been growing over the past year or so. Um, that If you have questions or comments, uh, I hang out there quite a bit. So you can find me there and other community members that will help out as well. So. Yeah, that is it. Any, if there's any questions, we're happy to take questions or anything else. That was so cool. Thank you so much, Nathaniel and Dan. Um, uh, I'll start us off and then other people should just jump in with whatever questions they have. We don't have too many people, so we can de-conflict if two people unmute at the same time. Um, but uh, I, I'd be curious to know what are like some of the more creative uses of chipsec you've seen in the wild? I mean, obviously, uh, it's nice to check that the chip you have on hand is in some sense secure or to look for vulnerabilities, but have there been any like unforeseen or, or bizarre use cases that have come up uh, since it was made open source? Hmm. That's a good question. I don't, 
bizarre, interesting use cases. I can't think of any off the top of my head. Um, I know, I mean, there, there's the general use of like uh, corporations or governments will use Chipsec to, if they're planning on updating their fleet of laptops for their cut for their employees, uh, they'll download Chipsec and run Chipsec on the systems just to make sure it, it's uh, generally secure. Um, on the research side, mm, there is a bunch. Uh, Aaron, do you know? Do you have any off the top of your head of good uses in the open source? I know so uh, a number of uh, research firms will uh, basically part out. It, they may not necessarily use the modules, but they will use the framework and, and build it into their uh, some of their tool sets. Which I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily unique or novel. That's kind of part part, part of the point. But um, um, it it's I wouldn't say it's common, but you do see it in the wild every now and then. Sometimes you run across a a black hat talk or DEF CON or something, and there's a reference to it, or you see some sort of output from uh, one of the modules. So some of the the more recent uses that I've seen of Chipsec is Chipsec also has a way. Um, if you have a binary file of your spy, a chipset can decode that and look for interesting things inside of it. Um, and so there's inside SMM, there's uh, SMM is secure management mode. Um, when a, C, uh, a system is in system management mode, um, there are things called SMM callouts where it is in this management mode, which is um, super high privilege, like it's it's above your OS and above, it's in firmware space that it's executing in. Um, and you can enter SMM while in runtime mode as well, but it's highly protected. But if you're in SMM, there's these things called SMM callouts or have been SMM callouts where SMM calls to memory outside of its special secure region. Um, and if you if an attacker controls those regions, it can be very bad because then you get code execution in SMM. Um, I know there have been some uh, it, research into that from external customers. Uh, so that, that's kind of a recent, but not super recent thing um, that people have been using it for. Okay, uh, since nobody's jumping in, I'll ask a follow-up. Are there similar tool sets for the other architectures, you know, the kind of non intelli things? And if so, how does that, how do the different ecosystems compare in terms of ability to, to find these sets of vulnerabilities in an automated fashion? So there isn't, to my knowledge, um, at least not in the open source. I believe there are some proprietary tools that other companies have. Um, with that said, uh, we do have an AMD contributor that he's actually part of the, the French government uh, that wanted to get AMD support. So he's been trying to contribute here and there to get AMD support inside Chipsec. Um, and we're also interested, we just haven't had the bandwidth to explore add, adding RISC-V or ARM architectures inside Chipsec. Um, RISC-V and ARM is a little it comes with challenges um, primarily because most of our detection currently uh, for what platform you're on is going through PCI and uh, ARM and, and uh, RISC five don't necessarily have PCI endpoints to to read. So there there's some nuances there that we need to look at if we want to fully support it. And we, we do want to, it's just time constraints. But yeah, I don't know of any any similar tools in the open source for other architectures right now. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I guess I would be very curious about like kind of niche 
devices that are used in applications and cyber physical systems, SCADA systems, stuff like that, where there might not be quite the quantity of engineering talent working on the device because it come, might come from some small vendor and, you know, be made just for that one water pump or whatever. And, uh, from like a national security perspective, those are often the most interesting <laughs> items. Right. So, uh, I, and I don't know enough about architectures to know what architectures those types of things often are, but um, you know, that would be a good argument for kind of wanting to have more diversity. However, who knows, maybe there's like a closed source version of chipsec we don't know about in Fort Meade that has that. <laughs> <We> have, <laughs> yeah. Right, right. The, if it is just a, like a PCIe endpoint, a chipsec is definitely able to talk to it. It's just how it, interacts with the system and how it interacts with uh, your OS or whatever's on top of it is, is the question there. But so like if the pump that goes through USB or something, potentially we could still talk to it. But if, yeah, if it's a standalone ASIC or something, who knows? How do you make sure that your open source contributions you get from people are not shady? Because this would be a kind of uh, interesting target also, right? Yes. Um, I guess the, the short answer is we review all the pull requests and it has to be approved by a code owner, which is us at Intel and or uh, the AMD owner. Um, with that being said, yes. <laughs> the number of requests we get for a signed Windows driver is... Uh... Probably the most asked for. That is true. So uh, the Windows driver, we do not publish a signed driver. So in order to get chipset running on Windows, you have to force Windows into a test signing um, environment, uh, which is non-trivial to get to, um, to be able to load a self-signed driver. So. Yeah, that, that's one of the things that we have said we will not do is create a Windows sign driver just because of the malicious aspect of it. If you have a sign driver, somebody will rip it and use it for nefarious ends. And sure, it might make our end users' lives a little simpler, but that's something that we're willing to sacrifice at this point. <laughs> yeah, that seems reasonable. Well, um, I don't mean to dominate the Q&A, but it seems like there's no questions from the audience. So uh, uh, I guess speak now or ever, forever hold your peace, but this was a fantastic talk. So thank you so much, Nathaniel and Dan. Um, and just to reiterate, it's fine with you guys if this is posted online, right? So people can watch after the fact. So yep. I saw the words Intel Confidential, which made me a little worried that- Oh, that's true. I probably should have removed that earlier. No, that, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And uh, Chris says, thank you for the presentation. So yeah, thank you guys so much. This is wonderful. Uh, I'll let you know once it's online and we really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. It's super cool. It's fun to see something in the real world like this and, um, uh, and a very, very interesting project and a great demo. Yeah, happy to, happy to share. Okay. Thanks for having us. All right, thanks.